right, welcome everyone. We're gonna get started. Thanks for joining us today for this informational webinar about the Atlantic Fellows for Health Equity. Hopefully you're joining us because you realize that we are uh, actively recruiting for our 2025 fellowship cohort. And we're excited to share some more information with you about the fellowship program itself, the application process, where to look for some more information, as well as take some time to answer your specific questions today about the fellowship program and application. So I'm Guinevere Burke. I'm the director and co-founder of the Atlantic Fellows for Health Equity. I've been with the program since we started uh, as an idea back in 2016. And I'm very happy to be joined today by our faculty, our fellows, and our staff. And so uh, a few housekeeping announcements um, that the presentation will be recorded today. It will be posted and made available for your later review. Uh, we also, because of the size of the crowd today and the amount of interest that we have, the Q&A or the chat function you'll notice has been disabled, but you are able to submit questions and our staff and our team will be uh, working, as I was told, furiously to answer them on the back end so you can get some real-time responses. So please feel free to type in those questions as they arise. And we'll also try to keep uh, lots of time at the end for exchange and dialogue on some of the most frequently asked questions. Um, and with that, we will get underway. All right, so a little bit about the Atlantic Fellows. Why does the Atlantic Fellows for Health Equity exist? It exists because we recognize that there are profound and life-limiting disparities in health and health care within and between every country throughout the world, and that these disparities can be mitigated. This can be accomplished by people and really only by people, those who are determined with the appropriate training all over the world, and we aim to provide that training. Our mission at the Atlantic Fellows for Health Equity is to develop global leaders who understand the foundations of health and equity and have the knowledge, skills, and importantly, the courage to build more equitable organizations and communities. A few Quick facts about the fellowship program. We are a one-year non-residential fellowship program. It's offered by the George Washington University. And this means that GW, as we discussed GW University, George Washington, is our institutional home, but we don't expect fellows to come and live and study in Washington, DC. Non-residential means that our fellows remain in their homes uh, with their families at their organizations throughout the course of the year and come together for the program experiences that I'll discuss in greater detail in just a moment. It's open to early to mid-career leaders who are involved in health-related work, and health-related work is really broadly defined, and that's very intentional. We recognize that health is impacted by so many things beyond healthcare, which many think of as their initial thought when thinking about health-related work. I invite you, if you haven't already, to take a look at the profile of our fellows on our website, and you'll see that they come from a wide variety of backgrounds, including those who are involved in health law, we have economists, those who design spaces for healing, artists, data scientists, and many, many more. Uh, and so I would invite you to take a look at their profiles. We accept 15 to 20 fellows per year from every country in the world, and we have no restrictions on countries that can apply to the program. Next slide, please. When we talk about bringing together very different groups of people from so many professional backgrounds and so many different geographic contexts, we have a few program values that really represent the core, how we build community among so many differences. We look in our application for fellows who hold these values dear as well. And those include, of course, equity, a commitment to inclusivity and orientation to action. So a real impatience and a desire to do something about the life-limiting disparities that I discussed early. These require courage to take action. We also look for humility, a recognition that this work is hard and requires collaborating with others, looking to community for answers and understanding uh, that that is an important prerequisite to really taking meaningful action. Our program and fellows also value diversity, of course, and we look for creativity as we look for solutions to these really challenging problems. Next slide, please. 
This is a very brief overview of the fellowship timeline. We follow the calendar year. So we kick off in January, 2025. That's the very beginning of the program. We come together at the beginning, middle and end of the year with online learning in between. So our initial convening in January, 2025 is two weeks in duration. Then we shift to online learning. We come together for one week at the mid-year convening, move again to online learning and have a final week together for our final convening and graduation in November, 2025. And I'll speak a bit more about each of these events um, in the coming slides. So this is another way to visualize the program year. So our convenings, as I mentioned, at the beginning, middle and end, each have their own specific objectives. And I'll talk about the convenings more in a moment. There's also online learning which takes place every two weeks to help develop and build upon the knowledge and skills that are introduced in our convenings. Each fellow also receives individualized coaching and mentorship, both from our faculty, as well as from the network of senior fellows and other friends of the fellowship program. Our convenings are really foundational to the program experience. So these include experiences for learning that you might think of in traditional classroom settings, like you see here with our senior fellow, uh, Kenneth providing information about his project and approaches to measuring and defining health equity. But we also blend that traditional classroom type learning with experiences outside of the classroom. So site visits, community engagement are really foundational to these convening experiences. There's also opportunities for networking and social events, which are important. It's okay, go ahead, keep going. So our initial convening at the beginning of the year, we take two weeks together. Traditionally, this has taken place in Washington, DC at our home at GW. And this is an opportunity for people who are coming from so many different backgrounds uh, with so many different um, approaches to health equity, educational experiences, et cetera, to have some common vocabulary, a shared knowledge base. We talk about fundamental topics like social determinants of health, for instance. And this is really the beginning of a year long journey. So there's a heavy emphasis on relationship building and beginning to form a cohort identity that will carry us throughout the year. Next slide. Our mid-year convening, as I mentioned, is a week long. In the past, this has taken place at the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda. And this is an opportunity to focus, instead of the US context, on um, the unique context and history of Rwanda. And really, we have a broader emphasis on the experience of low and middle income countries in achieving health equity. Next slide. At our final convening, we emphasize reflection. We've gone through a year long journey together at this point of learning and skill building. And our fellows present some of those reflections in what we call equity talks. And again, if you haven't had the opportunity, I would encourage you to visit our website and take a look at some of these videos. Um, these are professionally recorded and they're really um, inspiring, I think, <laughs> from having seen them in person and on the videos. Um, and they really provide uh, some insights into what the fellows have experiences, as well as some of their projects and some of the um, thoughts they have at the end of the year long fellowship. We also do some final skill building, uh, looking to long term success. Thanks for sharing the recordings. You can go ahead and keep going. After that graduation, oh, sorry, I forgot. Go ahead and go back. <laughs> After graduation, our fellows become what we call senior fellows or global fellows. And really the idea is that they enter into a new phase, exiting the year long experience. We hope that our fellows will become lifelong fellows, meaning that they continue to support one another and their community throughout uh, their careers. And so we support this by having senior fellow events where we get together with our senior fellows either to focus on a specific action that we feel is uh, really ready for collaboration. For instance, in the past, we've had these on immigration um, and refugee health. Um, we also have larger community building experiences where we invite the fellowship community to come together to renew those relationships and uh, their commitment to the work. We also are one of seven fellowship programs. So if you've not had the chance um, to look into the Atlantic Institute, 
They coordinate our senior fellows community and continue to foster community, not only with the Atlantic Fellows for Health Equity at GW, but with our sister programs throughout the world, which are committed to equity, um, also in health in some instances, also social and economic and racial equity. At this time, I'll turn to one of our senior fellows uh, who has engaged in some of these experiences, uh, Zuleika Santiago. Hello, everyone. Oh, my goodness. I'm speaking into a computer that is somehow connecting me to 249 other humans across the globe. It is amazing. I am Zuleika Santiago. I use she, her pronouns, and I bring you greetings from the land of the Eno, Tutelo, Saponi, Okanichi, and Shikori people also known as Durham, North Carolina, in the Southeast region of the United States. And I uh, wanna be true to my heart and also bring you greetings um, during this time of spring equinox um, from the more than human world. So I'm looking at my window and where I'm currently located, there is rebirth in every corner, the trees are budding, the flowers are blooming, the frogs and birds are going nuts singing. Um, and it's always a soothing balm for me and my sometimes weary spirit to remember that while there is genocide happening, while there are multiple ongoing wars and destruction and domination still run rampant among us humans, Simultaneously, somehow life prevails and the trees come back to their full glory and the rivers continue to flow towards the oceans. So I wanted to start my sharing with that and inviting all of us to just take a deep breath. To hold the paradox that is this life And to root in gratitude uh, for this opportunity, um, the opportunity that this fellowship afforded me so many years ago, and the possibility that it can afford you this opportunity as well. So as Gwen mentioned, I am indeed part of the OG cohort that is the very first, the trailblazers or the GGPs. I just made that up, it means gorgeous guinea pigs. Um, so we didn't have the benefits of this robust informational webinar. <laughs> we were kind of uh, figuring it out and it was a beautiful, beautiful exploration. And it makes my heart so happy to still somehow be connected to these humans after all these years. And my journey into this fellowship is a reflection of my life, which is not linear, very curvaceous with a few tangents and delightful detours here and there. Um, and when I applied to be part of this fellowship, I was the director of the North Carolina Oral Health Collaborative. Yes, as in teeth and mouth and dentists and hygienists, I had zero experience in the oral health world before I took that position, but I had plenty of experience in the immigrant justice, social justice and health equity world more broadly. And so a colleague forwarded me the possibility. I was asked to talk about my journey to the fellowship. So this is how it happened. They thought I would be interested. Indeed, I was. Inaugural cohort, I'm all about being a first, right? Um, traveling the world with some fabulous and brilliant human beings. Heck yeah, sign me up. And I had the honor of being interviewed by the magnificent Fitzhugh Mullen. And I just want to Ah, let that name and that spirit fly free. Um, he was integral in creating this fellowship and I will forever be grateful to him and to all of the staff of this program. And so somehow I must have said something that was interesting um, during that interview because they accepted me into the fellowship. Um, and lucky me, because I am still benefiting from the many, many layers um, of this fellowship. And now I should say up front that I am not a typical fellow if there is such a thing. Like I'm so glad that this fellowship uses the broadest sense of, of, of health equity to include those of us that 
um, bring more creative approaches. Um, and in 2018, the year after my fellowship culminated, I left that position with the Oral Health Collaborative. That organization that I was working with actually didn't use the word equity because they felt it was too politically charged, which says a little something about where they were and where I was. And I'm guessing I'm not the only fellow that felt affirmed and received clarity from the fellowship, which also meant some professional transitions. Um, so I am currently doing the work um, of health equity in a different way, not directly. Um, I am now an independent consultant. Um, in June, I'll be celebrating six years since being an independent consultant and having the greatest degree of freedom and sovereignty over my life and my days. It is truly a gift. And so now I get to support nonprofits and foundations who are doing the work of health equity, social justice in this world in different ways. And I also have to admit that I'm not the most active senior fellow. Um, what the pandemic did for me and for so many other humans is that it hyper-localized my life, my world. And so most of my work, most of my community exists within a four mile radius. Um, and that's very intentional. And so the fellowship though, the experiences, the people I connected, they live with me still. They have influenced for sure the type of leader that I am and how I show up in this world. And so although I may not be working in the field of health equity um, professionally in this current moment, this lens is infused into everything that I do. And I wanna be a little bit more concrete um, and say that during my fellowship, we got to travel, like Gwen said, to the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda. This was my first, first time in the continent of Africa, although I had dreamed of it since I was a 10 year old girl. Um, and I could speak for hours uh, about the layers of that journey, the questions, the reflections it provoked, uh, and the people who left an imprint on me. We moved from talking about health equity to actually witnessing health equity come to life in ways that were far more advanced than what I had been exposed to here in the United States. And the journey, my fellow fellows, the presenters, that land, oh my God, that land helped to instigate and inspire me. There were so many tears um, shed during that journey for me, some in sadness, despair um, at, at moments, and many of them in joy and delight and like heart opening. And I feel like a stronger, more well-rounded, more tender-hearted version of myself because of that experience. And the ripple effects of this fellowship continue and continue and continue. And so if we have time at the end, I'm happy to talk about some of my travel experiences as a senior fellow. My life partner is always like, wait, I thought you were done with that fellowship. And I sort of am, but I think this is a lifelong um, commitment and I'm glad for it. So um, yeah. With all the roles that I've played in my life, all of the twists and turns in my career, one thing that I am certain of is that we need us all. We need it all. We need all angles. We need um, your areas of expertise and expression, your gifts, my gifts, all of it to bend the arc towards justice, right? Although um, many of the folks in this fellowship, I don't talk to on a daily basis. Some I only connect with when I'm in person because I'm one of those in-person lovers, right? I need to squeeze you and feel you and see you. Um, but I know for sure that a seed has been planted in each of us and a mandate. Um, we've received our, a mandate to do our best in our own way in whatever corner of the world we're in, um, again, to bend this arc towards equity and justice. And there are folks, I am sure, that are far better than me and much more skilled and adept at connecting across geographies and time zones. Um, using these technologies, I'm a bit of a Luddite. I'm not even on social media. Uh, I, uh, yeah. Anyway, there are folks who are much better at that. If you are one of those people, then this fellowship for sure will open up to you in innumerable ways. If, like me, you're more inclined to bring the gifts of the fellowship back to your home community so that your roots grow deeper and deeper versus broader, 
I can attest to the fact that this is the best kind of nourishment um, and fodder for healthy growth. And plus, who knows what next twist my career will take and if and how I'll return to doing health equity work directly. So I wanna close by giving um, a concrete example, another one of how um, this fellowship has impacted my, my, one of my communities here. So for the last 12 years, I've been a part of this land collective called Earthseed Land Collective, which was just in the beginning stages when I joined the fellowship. Um, we had been meeting, but we hadn't found our land. And so this is one of the several passion projects that I'm involved with that I give my volunteer, volunteer time to. And I want to say that I've reached a point in my career where this thing about which hat are you wearing, which hat do you bring, whatever. I wear all the hats all the time. And I consider this to be one of many facets that contributes to this, to my sense of wholeness and well-being. So I'm one of seven founding members, all black and brown folks. Um, and together we get to be stewarded by 48 acres of land here in Durham, North Carolina. And this place, this land is where I get to explore and experience health in a more comprehensive way, where I get to extend that sense of health to our community, where we get to put our hands in the soil, reconnect with the earth, remember our small yet, in, yet significant place in this great complex web that makes up our planet Earth. And it is here that I am learning that it is not so much what I choose to do in life that matters. The titles, the positions, the organizations have become less significant to me. What's most important is how I choose to show up in my life, how I bring this earth-rooted, heart-centered presence into everything that I do so as to dismantle little by little this settler, settler colonialism mentality that would instill, instead compel me and compel us to produce, consume, produce, consume, rinse, repeat. So it may not be that I am the most active or globally involved fellow, but when I do engage, how can I bring my full self into my exchanges? Um, and encourage others to do the same. So how can this be a practice that ripples out into other parts of my life, across this computer screen, across the miles, across space and time? Because truth is, I don't know how long I have on this planet. We don't know how long we have on this planet as humans. But if we can use these few precious moments together, these life-changing experiences to enable us to connect across the globe to share our commitment to justice and equity. Why not make the absolute most of them? Why not make the absolute most of them? So thank you for listening to my nonlinear journey about my nonlinear life. I wish you the very best with this process and all you do. And I hope that you also find ways to get clear and clear on what makes you come alive so that you can bring your whole heart and your full presence to it. Thank you. Thank you, Zuleika. It's great to hear about the journey, the reflections. Appreciate uh, what you shared with us. Um, I'm going to shift to talking a bit about the curriculum uh, and invite our faculty to tell you more about it in just a moment. Uh, we have, as you will have noticed earlier, a blend of in-person and online learning. Our fellows come together online for two hours every two weeks in they discuss health equity and leadership topics in an alternating fashion. So at the beginning of the month, we'll touch on health equity topics and uh, foundations and shift in the second half of the month uh, to leadership topics and skills development and practice and reflection. And so I'll invite uh, Kate to share a little bit about our curriculum. Thanks, Gwen. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being with us. My name is Kate Hilton. I use she, her pronouns. I greet you from the land of the Abenaki peoples, uh, also known as Hanover, New Hampshire. And, uh, and to like I noted, the spring equinox, which was beautiful. We're about to greet nine inches of snow. <laughs> and something I know well uh, is as part of this program is that we, we need each other in the snowstorms, right? Um, and this, this fellowship is about coming together around some survival skills. Uh, that we need as leaders to support and enable one another to achieve outcomes in the face of 
inequities in the face of injustices and in the face of what we, we experience as snowstorms. So um, I'm the leadership uh, learning lead in the program, and I'm going to share a little bit about what we do and how we do it on the leadership side before my colleague, Dr. Kadi and Ndiahe will share about the health equity side. So what is it that we do? Um, I'm going to give you a bit of a like a sentence framing for the whole program, and then Kadi and I will speak to different components of it. So first of all, we're exploring ourselves as fellows in connection with each other and in community with each other and our own communities to understand inequity in health, to promote action with others to create a fair, healthier world. Okay, I'm going to say it again. We are exploring ourselves as fellows in connection with each other, our community as fellows and our communities at home to understand inequities in health and promote action with others to create a fairer, healthier world. So what does that actually mean? What do we actually do? Um, so on the leadership side, when we're exploring ourselves, we're doing all kinds of things. We're connecting with our personal values. We're connecting with our sense of purpose to action. We're practicing mindfulness practices. We're talking about self-care as leaders so we can support ourselves in order to support others. We are talking about um, being very proactive about identifying solutions and keeping a solutions orientation in the midst of that snowstorm. And to also be real about the fear and to understand the sources of our fear and build emotional conditions for courage to respond to that. Um, with regard to what we do in connection with each other and our communities, um, we're going to be, of course, as a fellowship interacting with folks from diverse backgrounds. And so as a result, we're gonna practice being open to and understanding diverse perspectives and approaches. So respect is fundamental. The ability to listen, to understand other humans is critical to how we show up in this fellowship. We'll be developing many new relationships, not only across the fellowship and with regard to um, you know, your peers, but also members of your own communities. And we'll be connecting and amplifying your work um, through connections with our staff and our GW community at the George Washington University. We will also um, support you to learn the skills to activate people's commitment in your health equity work. Now that could be in your professional work already. That could be in other work that you're taking forward because they're passion projects, they're things you care deeply about, or maybe you have your own organization and you're leading this work. Um, and of course, we're going to be inviting you to invite others who experience those inequities to be the authors of those solutions. So it's not about you. This is not a diva model of fellowship. This is about how are you taking responsibility to enable others to achieve a real purpose in the face and, and a co-created purpose in the face of what is always an uncertain snowstorm future. Right. So Kat is going to share a lot more about what we do to understand an equity in health. But I do want to say a couple things on the leadership side in terms of specific skills, because we ask you to learn skills and then apply them in your context to your work, to your lives, and certainly to your health equity projects. Your project is a vehicle for your learning to practice the skills together with others. So we invite you to practice. And by the way, you'll get to receive coaching. We invite you to explore relational methods for securing commitment and addressing conflict. We'll be working on storytelling uh, to motivate others to join you in action. We'll be thinking about um, distributed leadership, how to structure it, how to manage it, uh, how to support what it, what it is and means on our teams to take this forward. And we'll be looking at ways that we adapt quickly to other, our learning so that we can iterate to be effective in the face of new challenges. And we do all of this to take responsibility to achieve some real measurable outcomes in our health equity projects. So I've seen a bunch of questions come in about those projects. And I just wanna suggest a couple things about it. First of all, do we need to have a project? Yes, you do. And it's part of the application process. Does it have to be associated with your employer? No, but it really is helpful when it is. <laughs> because you do have to have the time and the ability to give to it. So you certainly need to speak with your employer if it's outside of your employment um, in order to have the time to commit to your project and to the fellowship, which itself requires a significant time commitment during the fellowship year. 
And I also saw questions about cost. You, your own organization, or your employer would cover the costs associated with your projects, the projects themselves. Successful projects frequently involve collaborating with others. Let me say that again. This isn't a solo project. It's not a diva model of leadership. It's about collaborating with others. Um, it's achieving something measurable by the end of the fellowship. And it's enabling you to practice your leadership skills in real time. We are not judging you on whether your project is successful or not. We certainly want you to be successful and we're here to equip you to be so. Um, but we are really looking for fellows who are willing to do the learning to contribute to a learning community who can be honest with themselves about that learning, willing to hold uncertainty, willing to acknowledge not just what works, but especially what doesn't, why, where that comes from within us, how we manage and cope with that emotionally, socially, psychologically, who can be real about who they are in this work and where your learning edges are. Um, so in addition to having courage and being action oriented, it's about having a learning orientation because how you show up in the fellowship affects the entire group. So we ask for a high level of commitment. You're going to hear from Christy, you've heard from Zuleika, you know, fellows get out what they put in. Fellows get out of the fellowship what they put in. So we ask for a lot. We ask for a very committed set of folks who are willing to meet program requirements because, again, when the way you show up affects everybody else in your cohort and what they learn and what they experience. So we create a rich learning opportunity, but that means everybody has to take responsibility for their part. That means attending all the convenings. That means completing all of the online content. That means trying the practice exercises in your own context and reflecting on that. That means having open and honest peer learning discussions with your peers during live calls every month. Um, twice a month and um, taking responsibility to facilitate those each other's learning in those calls, um, participating in, in coaching meetings with faculty. So we we don't want you to underestimate that this is a this is a thing. <laughs> Uh, and we, you know, if you're ready for that thing, we want you to apply. Um, so I think with that, I will I, I'll stop there. I'll turn it to my colleague Kadi to share more about the health equity content. Thank you, Kate. Hi, hello, everyone. My name is Hadi Jai. I join you from DC, but my home and my heart is uh, Dakar in Senegal. Um, so I would just build on what uh, Kate has been talking about, which is our learning, our online learning, and the framework of the fellowship. So my role is I'm the health equity uh, instructional lead. And what we do, um, I like to think about in, in terms of um, thinking about and, 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 and addressing and uh, identifying what are some of the tools that you would need to be able to do the work that you want to do. And can we, by discussing different perspectives, by including different strategies, by discussing different solutions, can we gain, can we allow you to be able to, or enable you or, or facilitate the process of you being able to learn what you need to learn to be able to achieve the health equity goals. So you all come in with a passion of health equity. There are some disparities that you have identified that you have seen in your communities, in your work that you want to be able to do something about. And we are trying to, within this curriculum, figure out ways for us to facilitate that process in the way that in by, by introducing different topics, by addressing different uh, solutions and strategies, like I said. So um, Kate has talked to you about the overall framework of the fellowship. So I will share a little bit about um, what do we do when it comes to uh, the health equity um, learning. So I can, like I said, I think about it in terms of tools. Um, that we are able to provide, and also competencies. What do we hope that you will learn? One of the things that we hope that you will learn is to understand health equity, to understand it not only from the perspective that you are coming from, from the realm that you are seeing, but also across the lifespan, um, across different life stages and contexts. What does it look like in North Carolina? What does it look like in... in um, in Addis Abeba. So what are some of the things, what can we learn from the fellow who comes from that perspective and that we can apply to our context? 
We also, along those lines, we have fellows who come from all different fields. So how can we integrate knowledges, approaches, methods, and values, and potential contribution from those multiple professions? How can I, as an MD, learn from somebody who does art therapy? How can I, someone who does labor work, learn from someone who is in, in environmental health? So that is very much the, the interaction, the that comes from being, being together as you go throughout the year is one of the things that we hope that you're able to gain through this fellowship. Another thing is we are very much thinking in terms of solution. So that comes in terms of what are some of the strategies and solution that we can promote within the communities, policies, and health system that we work. What can we develop that's innovative? What do we come, when we bring in all of this, this group together, if you're bringing all of these different perspectives, what is the magic that could happen? And how can we use that magic to be able to come up with some solution in the different contexts that we are? Um, so along those lines, one of the things that we are doing this year is we are including along with your project, something that we call our collective action. So we have different small groups of fellows um, based on the interest um, who are working together to be able to come up with what we call their contribution. So that contribution could be something in terms of the skills or competencies that they, they can share with other fellows, or it could be that they are proposing again by putting all of their heads together and the different perspective that they come in, the different context, what can they, what innovative solution can they provide? What innovative solution can they give um, to uh, addressing uh, whatever health equity, um, health disparities that they're seeing? So those are the kind of things that we do. And we're hoping that we are spearheading and, and essentially uh, starting this collaboration that will occur. As um, Gwen was saying, one of the things that happen is we're hoping that we're just starting this collective action that happens in this first year uh, where you are fellows is something that will keep going. So part of what we do is have that conversation. And of course, one of the other things that we do as we go through this entire process is to think about the ethical, contextual, and cultural consideration for addressing health disparities. Um, uh, Kate was talking about reflexivity. So as we go about thinking about addressing these issues, what do we need to be thinking about from a cultural perspective, from an ethical perspective? What are the implications? What are some of the uh, perspectives that we are not seeing? So it is important for us to do all of that. So uh, I hope this kind of give you a little a sense of what we're doing and we are really excited um, and we're here to also answer your questions. Thank you. All right, thank you so much uh, to both our faculty. I wanna shift to our uh, other senior fellow on the line to Christy Bram. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us, Christy. She's just completed the curriculum and the fellowship experience last year. And so really well positioned to comment as well. Thanks for joining. Thank you so much, everybody. And welcome to everyone who's at this webinar. So my name is Christy Adiola Bram. Um, as um, has, just, has just been mentioned, I am a Brand spanking new senior fellow. So I graduated um, from the most recent cohort um, of this fellowship. So the 2023 uh, cohort, I graduated in November. Um, so I'm very, I'm a very, very new senior fellow. Um, and all of my precious memories from my fellowship are still very, very fresh, which is great. Um, it's really good to be here at this webinar because I was just saying to <laughs> some of the faculty here that I actually attended this same webinar um, two years ago, um, pretty much in the same room and, you know, sitting in the same place. So it's, it's really funny to be on the other side of this. Um, but, you know, when I was applying to this, to this fellowship uh, two years ago now, um, I'd actually had my eye on um, Atlantic Fellows uh, for for a number of years actually probably since the the OG years where Zuleika was a fellow, um, but I wasn't yet in a position to to apply. I was doing you know I I, I was doing my PhD um, and I just didn't feel ready and I wasn't really in the yeah the right space in my in my uh, in my career. Um, but I I had also done another fellowship previously. Um, and you know that was supposed to be like a leadership sort of um 
program. But I found it really rigid um, in terms of perspectives on health. It was very Northern, um, it was not diverse at all, uh, very unstructured. And honestly, it was quite pretentious. Um, I didn't enjoy it that much. Um, and so I was instantly intrigued by, um, by, uh, by, by, this, by this fellowship here. And so when I um, had finished my PhD and I'd gotten started in the fantastic organization I work in, um it felt like the right time to finally uh, apply to this fellowship and I'm so glad that I did um and all of the things that attracted me to it um you know it, it turns out that I was right and uh and I can honestly I can honestly say this is the the best thing I've done with my career so far um I also just realized I forgot to introduce myself um and say what I'm actually doing and where I'm from so um I um I live in Belgium I live in Brussels but I'm from London um, with roots across West Africa and the Caribbean. Um, and I actually, um, I'm actually a specialist in workers' rights and public health. Um, so I work at the intersection of basically economic justice and health justice. Um, my work has always been about um, marginalization um, and building social and political movements um for people to realize the right to health that's always been that's always been the common thread um through my work um as part of this fellowship um so we, we've already heard um kate and cardi mention the health equity project which is a a crucial part of the um the fellowship beginning even from the application process um so my health equity project um, that I completed during the fellowship um, was basically about trying to understand um, who is doing really transformative work um, at the intersection of economic justice or injustice and health justice um, as it relates to the poorest, the lowest paid, most marginalized, most exploited, most exploited workers on our planet. Um, and that, you know, for, for those of you who don't know, many of those workers work in the, what we call the informal economy. Um, so I really wanted to identify, um, you know, what's happening across, across our planet and all these different um, geographical contexts, um, you know, who is leading that change and, and what tools do they need to be better supported? Because that, that is actually a crucial part of my job um, in the organization that I work in. I, I work to support um, the movement around workers' rights. So I, I, I work directly with trade unions and, and cooperatives and activist groups, et cetera. Um, so that was actually my health equity project. Um, I can also tell you that that is not the original health equity project that I put on my application form. It, um, my health equity project changed over the course of my fellowship um, as I realized that, um, um, you know, maybe my initial idea, which was to, to understand, um, the, um, you know, different currents of different social movements within um, the wider worker, workers, workers' rights movement. So whether that's feminism or migrants' rights, et cetera, you know, how they interrelated. But then I realized that was way too ambitious and way too broad for a nine month fellowship. So I kind of dialed it down. Um, and actually a, um, um, a really good, um, a really good way that I was able to do that was through the support of a mentor. So I know that Gwen mentioned earlier that you, 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 you're paired with a mentor um, who's um, most often a faculty member at George Washington University. So I had a fantastic mentor in Professor Pittman. Um, I'm not, I don't think she's here today. She's probably way too busy, <laughs> but um, she was my mentor. Um, you know, she was paired with me because of her professional experience um, and her personal interests um, in um, health workforce uh, and also um, the care economy. And uh, she's also been very active in the workers rights movement. And she gave me lots of direction um, with my health equity project. And also she's been really, really great um, with professional support, connecting me to other um, people within her network who do similar work. And yeah, so that's just, you know, that's a one really amazing thing about this fellowship. It's the level of support that, that, that you get. It's, it's really, um, it's really well-placed, well thought out, 
structured, authentic support as well. So I, I'm forever grateful to, to Professor Pittman and others in the faculty. Um, I'm just thinking more about um, the content of the fellowship now. So, um, you know, the curriculum um, around health equity and um, leadership skills that, that Kate and, and Cardi just alluded to. So we had a really broad curriculum, um, which was amazing because you got exposure to so many different areas of, 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 of health equity. And we, for, for those of us in the room who studied public health, we know how massively broad public health is and that people's health is determined by, um, most often by things that are, um, you know, that don't happen within a clinic setting. Um, so, you know, to have exposure to, um, you know, the connection between um, rural communities and, and um, you know, uh, communities who are incarcerated to understand sexual reproductive sexual reproductive health to understand economic injustice you know these are different topics that we're exposed to um but it's you know it's, it's it's it happens in a very different context to for example if you're someone who has studied public health in the academic setting because we're not necessarily giving lectures or listening to a lecture from um from uh, from an academic or from a researcher, you're actually understanding what that equity or inequity looks like um, on the ground. So you have real practical examples of people's work to address these inequities. And I think that's so important, especially speaking to someone who has who has studied public health academically. Um, there is no replacement for that. You know, it's such a it's such a great opportunity to really learn and understand beyond beyond a theory um and another way in which we are able to make those connections to the real on the ground work is crucially when we come together face to face um at the convenings and i know that zuleika um also mentioned this um as well but these are one of the highlights of the fellowship um you know our first convening was was, was the first time that we all met each other um that was in Washington DC. Um, we had opportunities to um, to visit um, different community initiatives. You know, we went out to Baltimore, and then suddenly, you know, you've got fellows from um, you know from from West Africa and and Southeast Asia and, and South Asia who um, suddenly you know are making connections between what's happening in their countries to what's happening in the U.S. when they see real inequality on the streets you know and then we went to Rwanda um where we had a fantastic week um um up in the up in the hills in northern Rwanda at the University of um, Global Health Equity um where we um shadowed community health workers and of course who can forget the final convening in Ethiopia where we had our graduation that was honestly one of the best weeks I've I've had in <laughs> um in uh in, in my professional career um, you know, so many opportunities to to get exposed to to the to the the real on the ground context and to be connected to a whole new network of people doing really important work on the ground, um, and um, you know, through all of this, you you're you're bringing in both the health the exposure to different health equity topics, but also crucially, um, everything that we learn for the you know during the leadership curriculum. Um, and the leadership curriculum in particular was really important for me because um, I think before I came to this fellowship, I always kind of had this understanding that leadership was a role or, you know, a job title, um, you know, your director of a program or project manager or whatever. Um, but actually, you know, through everything that we learned from Kate and, um, and that everything that we learned from each other, I, I gradually came to see that leadership is actually a practice. You know, anyone um, can actually practice those 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 values. Um, it, you don't have to necessarily be uh, someone who's um, a director of something, and, and that's something that I will will carry with me um, throughout the rest of my career. I think, and also I think you know beyond, um, and you know this fellowship has been so important for connection you know this is a real community and I'm and I'm truly not just saying that this is the most authentic and inclusive space I've ever entered in in public health world I know that I'm relatively um you know young in my career 
Um, but I have, you know, entered into a lot of different public health spaces um, and there is no space like this. And when you speak to more fellows, uh, um, current and senior, you will hear the same thing repeated over and over again. For so many of us, we've never been in space like this. We've never been in a space so diverse where you're speaking to people who um, are activists, doctors, community organizers, researchers, clinicians, whatever, from various different um, corners of the planet. We all have multiple identities. Um, and you know, so much of so much of, of of who we are as a fellowship and as a community is is rooted in respect um and you know opportunity to be vulnerable and, and be open with one another if you want to be um and a real deep connection and uh yeah i i just i i i, I didn't expect to 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 discover a community like that here uh but i'm so glad i have and you know there were some fellows i talked to several times a week almost every day in fact um and i think when you're in a community where you're also passionate about one thing, health equity or health inequity and addressing that. You know, you come to realize that it doesn't matter if you're, you're um, dedicating your, your life to, to, to this line of work in the Philippines or Ethiopia or Baltimore or, you know, somewhere in Canada. It doesn't matter the geographical location, even though those contexts are all different you come to realize that we're all fighting so you know this the same thing the same forces at play and you know that's just such a powerful way to to connect with one another and to build a community and so i'm just eternally grateful for um atlantic fellows for this opportunity um, i'm really looking forward to um continuing my journey um as a senior fellow because as we've mentioned it doesn't end um when you graduate um at the end of your nine months um, and I'm just so excited about the future and I'm really excited for all of you who go in and um, make an application and um, yeah, welcome. And, and I, I really hope we get to, to, to see more of you um, in future years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christy. Um, you shared some really beautiful sentiments. I'm so grateful and I can't wait to see you in July and give you a big hug. <laughs> Thank you again. Um, I want to shift to uh, Olivia, who is the primary point of contact. If you email that AFA at atlanticfellows.org email address, it will be Olivia on the other end uh, responding to your inquiry. So she's going to share some details about the application process with us now. Great. Thank you so much, Gwen. As Gwen mentioned, my name is Olivia Jefferson, and I'm a program coordinator with AFI. I've been here for about three years now, so this is actually my third recruitment cycle and I help manage the process. Um, and I'm happy to talk to you guys today about the application process, timeline, and some of our most frequently asked questions. So this is what the application timeline looks like for this year. April 11th is when the application closes, and then we'll have review rounds throughout the summer. So in June, we'll have our first round of applicant interviews, July, the second round. And then in August, we should be sending out applicant acceptance notifications. In terms of application details, which I think most of you are probably very curious about, I've seen a lot of questions come through in the Q&A. Uh, the application entails five parts. There's a statement of interest, and this is a brief statement, no more than 500 words, that should address reasons you want to be a fellow. And that could include major strengths and your unique personal and leadership characteristics, as well as a, a description of your experience and contributions to health equity. Second is the health equity project proposal. You've heard a lot of this discussed by our senior fellows and our faculty. This project should describe one health equity project you would like to complete during the fellowship term. It should also focus on a topic that's aligned with issues that you and or your organization focus on. It's a key part of our learning experience, and if selected for the fellowship, you will be coached by our faculty throughout the year regularly on the project. And as some of our fellows mentioned, your project can shift throughout the fellowship year as you learn more and you grow. We also ask for two letters of recommendation. These should be professional references who you are willing to have contacted in the final selection process, in addition to providing you the recommendation letter. And at least one of them should be from someone in a direct supervisory role. And this can be the same person that uh, signed your employer support form. 
In terms of the employer support form, this is probably the thing we get the most questions about. Um, this form, it just confirms that your employer, if you're selected for the fellowship, is willing to support your participation in the fellowship program. And that means protecting your time. So uh, it should be completed by someone ideally in a direct supervisory role. And we can address some more questions about that in the Q&A. And finally, we ask for just an updated CV or resume as the final part of the application. In terms of some of our most frequently asked questions, um, these are what we see a lot throughout the application cycle. So I'm gonna run through a few of them prior to opening it up for a Q&A from everyone. So who can write your letters of recommendation? As I mentioned, these are professional references who you are willing to have contacted and who are willing to be contacted in the final selection process, in addition to writing you that letter. At least one of them should be in a direct supervisory role, and that can be the same person as the person who signs your employer support form. Do you need to be currently employed to apply? The short answer is yes. The fellowship is an applied learning fellowship, um, which means that much of the coaching centers around applying the principles learned at the time of the fellowship to your current role and in turn making an impact in the health equity field. You're not required to stay in the same position for the entirety of the fellowship. And we recognize that some of you may be transitioning roles and that's okay as long as you have a role to apply these principles to at the time of the fellowship program. Now, what if you run your own organization? Um, if you do run your own organization, you, have, you can have a member of your board of directors complete um, the employer support form, as well as at least one letter of recommendation. And a second letter of recommendation may come from a professional contact who's familiar with your work outside of your organization. So with that, I will turn it back to Gwen to open it up for Q&A and answer many of the questions that we've seen coming through in the chat. Thanks so much. All right, thank you, Olivia. I've been seeing um, and passing many, many questions and I had a few flagged for me to go ahead and get started. Um, some of the questions we've received are about uh, specific jobs. So is my job, my field appropriate for this fellowship? Um, so just once again, we accept applications from anyone who is doing health related work. Um, and that is very broadly defined and we, welcome um, many different professions. I encourage people before to look at our uh, fellows directory on the website and see if um, and see kind of the breadth uh, that's represented there. And also to comment that if you don't see your profession there, that doesn't mean that you're not welcome to apply. So if you're if you're doing work that is connected to health, um, just make that connection clear to us in the application. So you don't need to be a doctor or a nurse or a physical therapist or anything in the healthcare field. Um, if you're a journalist and you cover health topics, if you're an activist, if you're a writer, um, if you're a designer who um, has a connection to health and healing, uh, then we're interested in hearing from you. Uh, another question that we received was how we account for inclusion of age, sexual orientation, gender identity, and disability in our selection. Um, so as much as possible, uh, if there are any characteristics that are highlighted or outlined in the application uh, or in the demographics section at each and every stage of application review and selection as we move from uh, reviewing the written applications to interviews um, to the final uh, selection phase, we examine how we're doing in terms of the diversity of the applicant pool to make sure that no um, no group is being uh, disproportionately affected uh, by the decisions um, and that every group uh, receives their due consideration. So we take that very seriously. Um, and Olivia is responsible for that analysis, which takes place at every opportunity. So uh, we really do seek to have incredible diversity um, as much as possible. It's, it's foundational to um, the work of the fellowship program. So the idea as Christy and others expressed, is that we're really learning from each other as much as from the program faculty and the experiences. Uh, and so when there's um, diversity in the cohort, everyone stands to benefit from uh, a different lens and a different viewpoint on the world and those different experiences that you bring to the program. Um, another question we received was, what would you say are the key factors that make an application to the fellowship stand out and be successful? And this is, of course, a great one. Uh, it's challenging because we talked about how diverse the applicant pool is, how diverse the fellowship is. Um, and I would say that um, 
if we can feel the passion for health equity in the application, that's a, a strong starting point and um, important for us um, to really understand how much you care about this issue. That's why we look at um, work experience to see that there's a commitment that has um, stood the test of time because this is really challenging work. Uh, and so if we can see that passion, see the commitment come through in the application, that's an important starting point. Um, we also hope that you have um, a strong desire to take action, as we mentioned, with that action orientations, a solutions emphasis. So really um, not only demonstrating kind of why you care about this, but what you want to do with that passion, what you want to do with that interest. Um, and many people, um, I think someone highlighted that many of the projects will be directly related to the work of your employer, sometimes not. Uh, the only other thing I would encourage is that if it is um, something that's related to the work that you're currently doing, highlight for us how you're going to take it that next step, how you're going to um, be still more ambitious, still more courageous in trying to tackle inequities in, in the context that you're describing, um, because that's meaningful uh, to us as well in the application process. Um, larger, I don't know, I guess I'll, I'll give the faculty as well a moment to add if there's anything you would add to what makes an application stand out. Thanks, Gwen. Um, I think in part, it's our interactions with you as a candidate in terms of the way that you present a solution mindset, the way that you're honest about who you are and willing also to be um, authentic in when things haven't always gone right, and then what choice you made in the face of that and how you've learned from that. Um, again, we're really looking for a strong learning orientation. We're looking for folks who are results oriented and solution oriented, who um, just persevere and uh, in, the, in the face of tremendous challenge uh, can find hopefulness in themselves and those around them. Uh, so there's, there's a variety of things that are also, you know, just about your interactions with us. Um, and so we, we really want to encourage you to be yourself, be who you are, um, show us who you are, help us get to know you. Uh, we are also putting together very diverse cohorts of folks from different geographies, different professions, different uh, identities, different uh, topic areas. And so we, you know, in part put together cohorts that um, reflect that type of diversity. So we always have a lot of super, super strong candidates. And for anyone who has applied, um, just want to note that every year is a new year. <laughs> Uh, and that um, in parts, the selection process depends on who else is applying and who else stands out and how to put together a very diverse cohort so that that cohort can do learning. Uh, we also, I just would say, we're looking for folks who are willing to hold themselves to account for both the commitment that it requires and the commitment it it means to, to share in sometimes difficult discussion. Um, and, and so folks that demonstrate uh, that level of maturity, doesn't matter how old you are, but who can hold, um, can hold, hold challenge, can hold challenge in a productive and supportive way to, to others. Kati, what would you add? I think you covered it well. The only thing I will add is we want to see when it comes to the project that you have a, a, a clear understanding of how this will impact your community. And we can help with that process, but this the project can just be, and to go back to what um, Kate was saying earlier about your own personal advancement, it has to also in, provide some impact into the community that you're working with, that you're a part of. Thank you so much for those important additions. Um, the next question that we have is about the larger takeaways that fellows have at the end of the year. And I think the best position to answer that are our fellows. So I'll turn that to Zuleika and Christy. What are the larger takeaways that you had at the end of the year? Ooh, let me let me search back in the cobwebs of my mind to seven years ago. <laughs> no, I would say um, mm, one is a uh affirmation that this is indeed lifelong work. Ooh, this is lifelong work. Um, this is complex, multi-layered, um, multi-issued work. Um, and I just responded to the to a question in the in the QA directed at me about, you know, how we'd knock it 
basically lost in the immensity of it, right? Um, and not get sucked in to despair um, in the face of so much, so much need, so much heartbreak, so much violence. And so for me, the greatest takeaway um, from this fellowship is a reminder of the goodness of humanity. Like it's so easy to get lost in a new cycle that just, you know, emphasizes all of the negativity happening across this globe. But what this fellowship did for me was to remind me that in all corners of the world in countries that I had never even been to or dream of going to even, there are good people dedicating their lives to somehow contribute to these complex issues. Like it not one of us, none of us, no matter how talented, how well-resourced, none of us can do this alone, can make any significant change alone, um, but together it's much more, much more likely. So that sense of solidarity, that sense of affirmation was my greatest takeaway. And Juleka said it, said it so well, um, so I'm not going to repeat what, <laughs> what she said, but um, I think another affirmation for me was just that sometimes the local is the global and the global is the local in that. And, and, and what I mean by that is that, you know, you think that um, the issues that you're seeing in your context that you work in um, might be unique to you or unique to the region in which you live but then when you're you know when your world opens up um and you know you get to engage with other people um from different parts of the planet you realize that a lot of the problems that that you're facing and that they're facing are essentially the essentially the same problems and a lot of them have the same root causes and i think that um kind of like solidifies this like the importance of collaboration and working together. And I think this fellowship really helps, like helps prepare you for that and gives you the tools to do that. Because just like Juleka said, you cannot do this alone. We're only gonna do it if we go together. Beautifully said from both of you. Thank you so much for those reflections. Um, the next question that we have is, can you um, explain the value of the fellowship to um, the employer? Um, so as we're asking people to fill out these employer support forms, what does a prospective fellow tell your, your employer about the proposed benefit of participating? And I really appreciate this one as we're receiving it. I flagged for Beth that we should develop specific content for this in the coming years. Um, I'm happy to see this emphasis. I think what I would say is that um, there is hopefully the benefit of the project or program that you propose, hopefully that has um, some aspect of benefit to the employer. We ask people to identify a measurable aim, as you'll see in the application process. Um, and although, as Kate mentioned, our emphasis as a fellowship program is less on you getting from point A to point B, B being the aim that you set for yourself, and more about um, accompanying you on that learning and uh, growth journey in the process of getting there, um, you will be provided, as mentioned, with dedicated coaching, mentorship, and support to achieve that aim. Um, so I would hope that that has value to your employer. In addition, I would share that a lot of our fellows take the training and um, uh, content of the fellowship and share that with their teams. Um, so a train the trainer type of approach, we're able to provide resources to help you bring some of the content uh, to your team so that you are the person primarily going through the fellowship experience, but you can certainly share some of the key takeaways, learnings and practices with your team to strengthen the team and strengthen the organization. So those are some of the value propositions that I would um, I would say. And then, you know, if um, if people do make it to kind of the final stage and, and need additional context, we could potentially reach out to uh, fellows um, and have employers. We've had employers attend the graduation, give us their personal thanks. Um, and we could try to make that happen um, if we get down to that final stage and, and people need some additional endorsements. Um, I don't know if others would add to that. It's a new question we've not really received before, uh, which I think is probably surprising in seven years, uh, but I'm really happy to see that. Yeah, I mean, I'll just add quickly because my work as an independent consultant is working with a lot of nonprofits around organizational development. And although this isn't a diva, diva model of fellowship, I love that. Kate, thank you. 
Um, I would say that generally what I say to many, not many of the organizations I work with is organizations are only as strong as the individuals that make them up, right? And so these types of opportunities strengthen us as leaders um, in a way that ripples out, like ripples out to the people that we're managing, to the people that we're collaborating with, makes us stronger collaborators, which I think is essential for any employer. Thank you for that. All right, and I know we had some more questions in here. Um, a lot of questions I understand uh, center on the health equity projects, and we always get uh, requests for sample projects or templates for people to guide in the application process. We've always hesitated uh, to provide these examples only because there's no one right project, right? When we're talking about people who come from so many different perspectives and approaches uh, to achieving health equity, there's not going to be a one size fits all solution or a one project um, that will be successful. Um, I would just comment and then I'd, I'd invite our fellows to comment as well that from our perspective, um, the fellowship project you've heard that this is work that can't be done alone, right? So we take that to heart. So if your fellowship project, you find yourself writing and it's all about what you will do independently in your house or at your computer, that's not likely to be a successful project from our perspective because the skills that we're emphasizing are really about bringing others along with you in the journey um, and really engaging with community. Um, so I would say that that's an important um, part of the project that we will be looking for in each and every one. Um, but that they're all going to be just a little bit different. And so um, I think Zuleika, you already shared a bit about your project and Christy, you did, but if there's anything you'd like to add about perhaps the initial proposal or um, some considerations there. Well, I mean, the only thing I'll add quickly, um, th there was some evolution that happened to my project. So I think that's expected and that that's okay. Um, but this also connects to the question around strong application. What I would say is that with, with any of these like competitive programs, it's like authenticity. What is the authentic voice? What is the authentic perspective that you're bringing to this huge conversation of health equity? And let that shine through, like let, let your heart shine through. And that is for me always the strongest response. Yeah, Zuleika's right in terms of saying, let let your heart shine through. One thing about this fellowship is um, we want to see the real you and we want to understand what you're really passionate about and what you feel, what you really feel is is the best way to, to yeah, to, to go about addressing that and how you perceive the challenges and roadblocks in your way you know we we don't want we we don't want to have a fellowship of robots we're we're all real people we're all real people with with real experiences um we have so much in common but that we also have many differences and that's fine that's great even um so just just you know if you have an idea for for a health equity project um obviously you want it to be practical um, as 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 much as possible, but you know, also to create space for um, the possibility that it might change. And then, as 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 I said in my presentation, you know, my one did change. Um, actually, not in a small way. Um, I think the 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 larger aims were the same, but the you know the 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 minute details really changed. And that's not that's not exactly um, strange. Like for, that was the same for many of us. So you know, just. Show, show us who you really want to show us who you are and what you really want to be doing and and just and let that shine through we, we'll all we'll all be able to 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 see the value of 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 your work thank you for that um and the other questions that we've been getting are about how many applications we receive how many people apply um, hundreds is the short answer. Um, you see, we've got hundreds on the line today. Um, and you know, the numbers fluctuate from year to year. Um, so I can't really give you a percentage because every year it changes. Um, I will say that, um, the formal name of the program is Atlantic Fellows for Health Equity U.S. and Global. Um, and we've shifted a little bit from the original design where it was half U.S. fellows. 
uh, and half applicants from outside of the US. Um, and so we now have a majority of the fellows who come from uh, countries besides the US. Um, but uh, we receive far fewer because there's far fewer people in the US than the rest of the world. Uh, so I'd say if you're a US-based applicant, uh, you probably have a slightly better chance of being accepted. Um, and um, otherwise, you know, I would, uh, I don't know, I wouldn't get lost in those numbers. Uh, they fluctuate and, um, and that is what it is. In terms of coaching and mentors and how those are selected is the next question that I'm seeing. Um, we have a, um, we have our coaches who are our faculty, um, uh, provide coaching throughout the year, um, that is largely related to, um, the project proposal that develops and evolves through the years, through the year, as people have noted, it also continues to evolve after the graduation and those years to come. Uh, so there's project specific coaching. There's also other coaching, uh, to kind of check in on how you're doing and receiving the curriculum and then as others have mentioned you know we're all real people and things happen outside of life so there's um and a willingness and an openness certainly to talking about everything and everything else and um, trying to uh, navigate the different challenges that people face personally and professionally um and our mentors are largely uh, faculty, as Christy mentioned, but also our senior fellows community as it continues to grow, offers a tremendous pool of really accomplished professionals who um, are close to this experience and have also navigated uh, some of the transitions that people are experiencing often when they apply to a program like this. Um, so that's the majority of our mentorship pool. It's uh, faculty, fellows, and then I'll, I'll say kind of friends of the fellowship, so people with whom we've worked closely over the years um, who are uh, dedicated to this work. And we have to have a broad network to speak to the range of expertise that our fellows bring. And any other questions that are coming up that we should respond to or anything that our uh, faculty and staff want to add? Yes. To just raise one, because we get this question a lot um, about what if I run my own organization, additional details on kind of who can sign my employer support form if I don't have a board of directors, for example. Um, and Gwen, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I believe we've said either a co founder or another person who's very familiar with your work. At that point, if you run your own organization, there's no board of directors co-founder or someone who's familiar with your work can sign the employer support form on your behalf and they should also provide that letter of recommendation so we have more details about your relationship. Exactly. I would say a longtime collaborator or colleague um, could function in that capacity and provide the support form. Um, and, you know, I would say the only person I would discourage is an employee, right? Someone with whom you have a, a relationship like that. Um, someone who could feel um, that they could be very honest in assessing kind of where you're at and uh, the time that you have to dedicate to the program could do your recommendation or employer support form. And the only other um, big question I keep seeing coming up, I think we've discussed a little bit, but the idea of the fellowship project and it like ending or being completed within the fellowship year what are the expectations around that and uh, relatedly can you um, suggest a project you're already working on um, as part of the proposal mm -hmm. those are all great questions um so let's take the last one first so can you propose something you're already working on certainly as i mentioned earlier the hope would be that you not only say i'm going to continue doing the work that i'm doing but talk to us, share kind of those hopes and dreams for how you could do the work that you're doing and make it even better. Take it that next step. Kind of allow yourself to dream. That's part of the, the purpose of this program. You know, these convenings are, are powerful in the one part for the community, but also just the, the time to step back, to reflect. And we hope that you'll go through that, through the process of the application as well. Kind of take a moment, allow yourself to dream. It's really hard sometimes when you're, um, when you're caught up in everything that's happening um, that's really challenging in the space. And if you're proposing something that you're already working on, take a moment to think about how you can um, you can make it even more ambitious and share that uh, with us. The other aspects of the project that you mentioned is um, how much can it evolve or change? Was that the question, Beth? Um, just the idea of like, does it need to be completed within the year? And like, what does that sort of like ending or completing really look like? Yep. Thank you. Sure. So we will ask you to outline something that you think can be achieved within the, the year-long fellowship, which is really 11 months, so not the full 12, um, 
But if you have something that's more ambitious, uh, certainly you can include that and just provide for us the part that you think you could achieve in the fellowship year. We see a wide range of proposals from everything of I'm going to change the national policy of my country related to X um, to I am going to work uh, with this small group of people on issue Y. Um, and they're both they're both acceptable. They're, you know, you if you're a national level policymaker, you could change policy X uh, for the country. Um, and so I won't say that there's you know a, a, a scope that we need to see. We're really looking to see how you approach the issues, how you think about um, who you need to engage, right? Which we've emphasized really how this work is inherently collaborative. So how you conceive of the different processes, who you think you need to bring in, uh, what your leadership team looks like, how much you're um, taking into account those different factors as you put your project proposal together. And then as others have mentioned, we accept that you know, what you put in the application is very likely to change because that's the nature of the work. Often people look for fellowship experiences when they feel that they're at a transition point in their careers. And so we accept that your employer could change, your project could change. Uh, and what we're really looking for is to see kind of what you're, um, what you're interested in, what you care about and how you conceive of the steps to get there. Um, and then when you enter the fellowship as a fellow, we'll look to make some firmer commitments about what you wanna do um, so that you're really holding yourself accountable as Kate mentioned for um, taking action uh, and making a difference in the health equity space. Other questions, comments? We've gotten down to three in the Q&A, 185 questions answered, woo! Thank you to our faculty and staff and fellows and the whole team. Um, I'll just answer the last ones live. Yes, they have a word limit um, and um, you don't need to go on at length. You can keep to that uh, limit, the application link. I guess I'll let you guys put that in. Um, oh, project funding. I might just mention this because I know this one comes up a lot. Um, in terms of funding, the fellowship covers all expenses related to participation in the fellowship. So that's your travel, your visa, your accommodation, your food while you're with us for those convenings and events. Uh, for people who need support um, for internet to participate in the online, we are able to um, offer uh, some internet support for that. Um, so we cover those types of expenses, those that are related to participating in the fellowship experience itself but we do not provide um, funding for the projects per se. So there's no dedicated amount for you to execute and complete your project. Um, we're happy to connect you with mentors who might help you identify funders um, to help you uh, and link you to grant writing resources, et cetera. Um, but the fellowship does not fund the projects. Uh, so that's an important point to mention. Uh, different time zones accounted for the online sessions. It's very challenging. We have people who are online, you know, at 10 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock at night. Um, we've spanned from Hawaii to the Philippines in a single cohort, um, and that's a wide stretch of time zones. Um, and so we're really grateful to our fellows who make the effort uh, to come. We had one who would get up at four o'clock in the morning for every online learning session um, and, you know, did that for the entire year. He was a morning person. We were grateful for that. Uh, it is a challenge. Other questions that I should answer here. Uh, is academic certification given? That's a good one. I think I can address um, Rapidly, so there's no credit, um, like formal educational credits that are received from the George Washington University, but we do provide each graduate with a certificate of completion, um, and you can continue to identify yourselves as Atlantic Fellows, as long as you remain in good standing with the program, and you're welcomed into the formal network of Atlantic Fellows, the seven programs that I mentioned, and upon graduation, uh, attend an induction ceremony at the Atlantic Institute at Oxford University. All right, I think we're approaching time, so I might call it and thank everyone for joining us. Uh, thank the team here uh, for your remarks and your presentation, and we will look forward to seeing all of your applications. If you have additional questions, please do reach out uh, to Olivia and the team at AFHE at AtlanticFellows.org. 
We also have a newly released uh, application and recruitment prospectus, which has even greater detail on the program, the curriculum, and the different aspects of the application. And that is available to you on our website. Thank you. It was great to uh, receive your questions and we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks.